Hello, I am Kathy Dixon, Director of Museums and Historic Sites with the Oklahoma Historical Society. And if you have no idea how to go about developing a strategic plan, or maybe you aren't even sure what a strategic plan really is, then you're in the right place. If you'd like to contact me sometime after the session, when you have uh, thought about it for a while and you have more questions, my contact information is right here on this slide. My email is kdixon at okhistory.org, and my direct line is 405-522-5231. And if you forget all of that, you can always go to the Oklahoma Historical Society website. Down at the bottom of that page is a link that says contact us. When you click on it, you get a directory of all of our staff members as well as their contact information. So there's multiple ways to always get a hold of someone with Historical Society. So now when someone starts talking about a strategic plan, they start throwing out all of these words like mission statements, vision statements, SWOT analysis, SMART objectives. And it can all be a little overwhelming, maybe a little intimidating. We're gonna take all of that intimidation factor out of the process and walk through it step-by-step, step, look at what each of those term, terms mean and help you figure out how to put together a strategic plan for your institution. So how far should you be looking out when you're developing a strategic plan? Well, since we don't have crystal balls and we don't know how to read them, I would say you shouldn't really be trying to look out any more than three years into the future. When I first started working in the museum field in the late 1970s, five and 10 year plans were very common and it wasn't all that unusual to come across a 20 year plan. Now, I think 20 year plans, even though I've been involved in developing a few of them, are totally worthless. When I got my very first museum job in 1979 and then looked 20 years into the future to 1999, I don't think there's any plan you could have developed in 1979 that would have any relevance whatsoever in 1999. There were just too many changes that happened in that time frame in the workforce, in technology, in the way we do our business, the way we live our lives. So I don't think that the 20 year plan has any validity. I really don't think five and 10 year plans have a whole lot of validity because there are just too many things that change too quickly in our modern world. So I think looking at three year chunks of time is much more manageable. And even those plans can sometimes get blown totally out of the water by things we didn't anticipate. For instance, I don't think anybody had dealing with a worldwide pandemic in their three year plan. Maybe if you worked for some health organization, but other than that, none of us foresaw a, a pandemic. So if you can't plan, some of you may be thinking, why do we need a plan? Since we can't tell the future, we don't have a crystal ball. Well, plans can help you maintain your sanity for one thing. They can also help you maintain your focus. I hope all of you have seen the wonderful uh, cartoon that came out many years ago now called Up. If you haven't, I do highly recommend it. And there is an adorable dog in it who talks very fast and goes on very fast and very repeatedly and he's in the middle of a sentence and all at once he says, squirrel. Well, that's what happens to you if you don't have a plan. You get distracted by squirrels or shiny things and you start going off in another direction that has nothing to do with where you need to be going, but it was something that interested you in the moment and then you forgot what you were doing. So with a plan, you can cut down on those squirrel distractions. Um, if you do still get distracted by a squirrel occasionally, it helps you come back to where you need to be and refocus on your plan and get going again. You may find that you have a clear idea of the destination for your institution and you're working very hard to get there. But when you start talking with other staff, other volunteers, other board members, you may find that they have a very different future in mind for the organization. Or if you do have the same future in mind, you're going about totally different routes to get there, which causes a big waste in time, energy, and financial resources, which all of those are things that are in very limited supply for most nonprofits. You could find that you end up doing something this year that two years down the road you have to back up and undo because it's not helping advance you to where you need to be. 
So you really need that plan to make sure you're all headed to the same place and that you're following the same path to get there. Now, a lot of you are probably like me, you like to keep to-do lists, all kinds of lists. I have lists for everything. But that list, particularly if you just have a long list of to-do lists, can get very overwhelming and intimidating and sometimes just the thought of looking at it can stress you out. Well, a good strategic plan can help you tame that to-do list so that you don't feel like you're buried under it. So you can start figuring out your priorities, what you need to concentrate on now, what you can ignore for a while, what's gonna help get you the most advantage to advancing your plan for the future. So it can de-stress that to-do list. And some of you are probably jigsaw puzzle people. I'm not one of them. To me, the thought of putting together a jigsaw puzzle stresses me out. I don't have that kind of patience. But I know many people who do enjoy jigsaw puzzles. What if your jigsaw puzzle came to you in a plain brown box? You have no idea what the picture is. You don't even know how many pieces are in it, and you dump all the pieces out, and now you're supposed to put it together. Well, it may not be impossible, but it's not going to be very easy in the thought about doing that just makes me want to pull my hair out. But now think about it coming to you with a picture on the box. You know how many pieces are there. You know what it's supposed to look like. That's very important. So now that I know what it's supposed to look like, I can start sorting those pieces into pieces that look like they might be part of the sky or part of a lake or part of a meadow. And the pieces that might be borders, I can start separating those. So once I separate them into categories, then I can start working on those categories that I think are most important or going to get me to completion the quickest. That's what a strategic plan does for you. And if I haven't convinced you with any of the other reasons, a final reason for developing a strategic plan, although in my opinion, it's not the best one at all, is that many granting organizations require a strategic plan as a condition for applying for their funds, including the Oklahoma Historical Society with our Heritage Preservation Grants. And the reason for that is not to try and put some obstacle into your, in your way to try and apply for funding. It's because those organizations know that the, the institutions that are going to be most successful are those that have a plan for their long-term viability, as well as for the specific projects they're trying to get funding for. So that's why as many granting institutions require them. So you need a strategic plan. What's your next step? Well, part of it is figuring out what your plan is going to look like. Many of you probably think that a strategic plan needs to look like war and peace, a very thick, intimidating volume that takes months and months and hours and hundreds of hours of staff time and volunteer time to put together. I, I've seen strategic plans like that. I've even helped develop a few strategic plans for like that. And we all pat ourselves on the back and think how wonderful we are that we got this plan finished and aren't we great? We put all that work into this plan. But then you know what happens to those plans? They sit on the shelf and they gather dust because nobody's ever going to weed back through that thick volume to figure out what's in it. If you are trying to come up with what you need to do in your collections, or you're not going to go back searching through this document to figure out where you talked about collections and what your next steps were going to be for collections. So those thick plans, they're totally useless. A good strategic plan is going to be three to 10 pages long. That's it, that's all. And in fact, 10 pages is pushing it. You should really be able to get it down to six. So I hope that takes a little bit of intimidation out of it and thinking that you don't have to write the great American novel. Instead, you're just um, writing a short essay in essence. So it's gonna be just a few pages long. Now, a great way to start your planning process is to have a retreat of some kind. The yoga and meditation are optional, but it's really great if you can get away with board, staff, volunteers, all together someplace away from your institution. It's great if you can spend the night, take a weekend, spend working on your strategic plan, getting to know each other and just talking. 
if you can't get away somewhere together, maybe just leaving your building. Maybe there's an event center in town you can go to. Maybe there's a park you can go to. Some place that you're out of your normal space. So you're not trying to answer telephones. You're not trying to deal with visitors. You're not in responding to emails or text. So get away together. Particularly if you are new to strategic planning, it can be very helpful to have a facilitator help you. A facilitator is just a person that makes the learning process, um, the meeting go easier. It's their job to make sure that everyone is contributing so that you don't have one person sitting in the back of the room not participating. And on the opposite side of that, they also make sure that you don't have one person dominating the conversation that keeps everybody else from being heard. So the facilitators can be very, very good at this. They're also great at seeing the elephants in the room. Sometimes a problem is right in front of us and we're talking all around it, but we don't see it because we're too close to it. And on the opposite side of that, sometimes the answer is right in front of you. The solution is right there, but once again, you don't see it because you're too close to it. If you're looking for a facilitator, um, the Oklahoma Center for Nonprofit uh, does do some facilitation. I'm sure that the Oklahoma Museums Association can help uh, recommend someone to you to consider. And there's also the Mountain Plains Museum Association, uh, which has a group of retired museum professionals who do consulting uh, work for just basically their travel expenses. But I will say it does not have to be a museum person that helps you with your strategic plan. They are simply someone who has been trained to go through that facilitation process and make sure that everyone's contributing, that it's all coming together in a cohesive plan. So it doesn't have to be a museum person. So what do you do if you don't even have time to get away for a day for a retreat or even just someplace in town? I know it's, it's very busy. We're all very busy and it's a crazy time as we're trying to deal with how do we operate in uh, the world as it is today. There's still ways to do strategic plans. I serve on the board of an international organization called uh, the Association for Living History, Farm and Agricultural Museums, ALFAM for short. I'll mention it again a little bit later when we talk about the planning process. And we typically have an in-person board meeting in the spring and in the fall. And this last fall is when we were uh, to tackle our new strategic plan for the next three years into the future. Uh, on that year, that third year when we're developing a new plan, we add a, another day to our board meeting and work through the plan. Well, with COVID and borders being shut down, there was no way that we could have an international gathering to work on our planning process. But we didn't want to continue operating without a plan either. So we came up with what we called ninja strategic planning. You're free to steal that term. We didn't trademark it in any way, but it was kind of a way to sneak up on our planning process. It, it's not the best process, but it's certainly better than not having a plan at all. And what we did, um, since we knew nobody could face the thought of two days looking at a computer screen, in Zoom meetings to come up with a strategic plan, we broke it down into manageable bites. So we scheduled two hours every other Tuesday afternoon, and we tackled one topic at a time. And once we had our goals, then we started tackling the objectives under those goals. Once we had those, we started talking about action steps and then the, the timing and who was going to do them so that we took it in bite-sized chunks and at the end of the two month period, we did have a strategic plan. Now, I have to say that's not the best way to go about a strategic plan. Uh, it is harder to get everybody engaged when they're in little boxes on the screen, but it is, is better than no strategic planning process. So you're ready to start on your strategic plan. There are four big questions that you need to answer when you're going through your planning process. The first one is why do you even exist? What's the reason for your institution? What goal, what is your goal? Why do you exist? Then you need to take a look at where you are now. What does your operation look like? Um, 
this is kind of your benchmark. So you can see where you have, what you've accomplished, how far you've come. So you need to have a good picture of where you are right now, what your building looks like, what your collections look like, um, what your financial resources look like, what your visitation is, what your programming. So just take a little bit and analyze exactly where you are now. It's your little snapshot of your operations today. Then you wanna figure out where you want to be in the future. So you know where you are now, you know why you exist, you know where you are now, where do you wanna be? And then how do you get there? And that answer to that question, how do you get there? That's your strategic plan. But you need to know the answers to these other questions before you can figure out how to get there. So let's take a few minutes to talk about mission versus vision and what the difference is. That first question on the previous slide, why do we exist? Once you answer this question, you have your mission statement. And where do we want to be? Answer that and you have your vision statement. This is the organizational equivalent of what do you wanna be when you grow up? So the best mission statements, because that's the foundation of everything, are attainable. It needs to be something that can be accomplished. It needs to be clear. You shouldn't have to explain your mission statement to anyone when they read it or hear it. It should be inspirational. It's not a fact sheet and inspirational for both your organization and for people outside your organization. And it needs to be short. Nobody wants to look at a mission statement and like they're trying to memorize the charge of the light brigade. It should be something that's easy to remember that all the staff, volunteers, the board, they can know it by heart without thinking about it. Print it on the back of your business cards. I even think it's a good idea to put it at the top of your board agenda for every single meeting so it's there as a reminder. And everything on that agenda or anything that comes up for discussion should relate to that mission statement or you're going off on the wrong track. If it's not mission related, it shouldn't be part of your discussion. So mission statement, let's talk about um, some mission and vision statements from the corporate world as examples to look at. TED, I'm sure that virtually all of you have heard a TED talk, uh, listen, uh, watched a TED video, their mission statement, spread ideas. Well, that's attainable. It's clear, it's inspirational, and it is really short, two words. I'm not a part of TED and one read and I already memorized their mission statement. Their vision, TED is a global community welcoming people from every discipline and culture who seek a deeper understanding of the world. We believe passionately in the power of ideas to change attitudes, lives, and ultimately the world. Now remember, this is a vision statement. You probably haven't achieved this yet or it's not your vision, but this is what you're working towards. LinkedIn, their mission statement is to connect the world's professionals to make them more productive and successful. Their vision statement, to create economic opportunities for every member of the global workforce. Once again, their mission statement is clear. It's a little bit inspirational. It's short, it's achievable. So it meets all of those standards. We'll take a look at a couple more. JetBlue, their mission statement, to inspire humanity both in the air and on the ground. Their vision, we are committed to giving back in meaningful ways in communities we serve and to inspire others to do the same. PayPal, their mission, Reimagine money to democratize financial services so that managing and moving money is a right for all citizens and not just the affluent. Vision. Every person has the right to participate fully in the global economy. We have an obligation to empower people to exercise this right and improve financial health. And one more for the from the corporate world. IKEA. Everybody knows about IKEA and their furniture. Well, their vision statement, their mission statement, 
offer a wide range of well-designed functional home furnishing products at prices so low that as many people as possible will be able to afford them. Now that's a little bit long, but it is one sentence. Their vision to create a better everyday life for many people. Now, one of the things you'll notice is I haven't given you any mission or vision examples from the museum world. And there's a reason for that. I don't want you to cut and paste. I want you to do your own deep dive into your mission statement and vision statement. And even if you already have a, a mission statement, take another look at it. Maybe you need to revise it slightly. Maybe you need to make it shorter. Maybe it needs to be clearer. Maybe it's not inspirational. So take another look at it. Mission statements can change. They can be tweaked. But I'll give you a couple from the museum world. The Smithsonian Institution, for instance, their mission, the increase and diffusion of knowledge. Their vision, shaping the future by preserving our heritage, discovering new knowledge and sharing our resources with the world. And one last museum example, the Buffalo Bill Center of the West. Their mission, connecting people to the stories of the American West. Now, if you want to take a deep dive into more mission statements, almost every company, every nonprofit, every museum has their mission statement right on their website. If you don't have that on yours, I highly recommend that you put it there. It's uh, not all of them have their vision statement on their website, but I think it's a good idea to put that there too. I want to share one last vision statement. That was a very early one from a tech company we probably all know, a computer on every desk and in every home. That was a very early vision statement from Microsoft. Now, when they came up with that, I'm not sure of the exact year, but when they come up with this vision statement, I'm not sure everybody would have thought that was attainable, but that was their vision and they've pretty well, it's pretty well been achieved. So you have your, your vision, you have your, 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 your mission, you have your vision. Now it's time to take a look for a, at a SWOT analysis. <clears throat> So a SWOT analysis, one of those terms you hear that can be very intimidating, but it's just taking a look at the strengths, weaknesses, and opportunities that are out there for your organization. So start with your strengths. What is really strong about your institution? It might be your community really supports you. Um, it might be that uh, you have a really dedicated volunteer for us force. It might be your staff. It may be that you have a great endowment, probably not too many of us have that, but whatever your strengths are for your organization, list those. What are your weaknesses? So where are you vulnerable? Um, maybe it's um, a lack of financial support so that you're operating year to year. Maybe it's that your volunteer corps is aging and you're having a difficult time replacing those with younger volunteers. Maybe it's that your collections are mostly on loan and then at any time uh, the lenders could come back in and reclaim those. What opportunities are out there for you? Maybe um, it's a new company is moving into town. So they are maybe a new corporate sponsor for your facility. Maybe they're bringing in new younger families that are an opportunity for uh, more volunteers and increased attendance whatever the opportunities are in your area and for your institution. And what are the threats? Um, is it that you get city funding right now and that count, that city sales tax might be going away? Is it that um, your roof is about to fall in and you could lose your building or maybe your building is leased and you're afraid that someone is gonna pull that lease on you. So whatever the threats are for your organization, they're all going to be different. So you have your mission, the why you exist, and you have your vision where you want to be. And now you've taken a look at your strengths, your weaknesses, the opportunities and the threats out there that you face. So what do you do now? Well, now's the time to start looking at developing your strategic goals. So your mission is what should be guiding everything. 
you have your assessment of where you looked at, where you are right now, so that's your starting point. And your strategic goals are just your stepping stones that are going to get you from where you are to where you want to be, your vision. So that's all they are. You should have three to six goals. That's plenty, seriously. Don't have any more than six goals and probably six goals is pushing it. Remember, this is for a three year time period. You're not gonna solve all the world's problems in three years or even all of your organizational problems. So the three to six goals that you plan on focusing on for the next three years. The three years after that, your goals may change based on what's happening, what has happened in your organization, what your opportunities are out there then, what's happening in the world. Three to six goals, that's it. Come up with a format. There are many different formats to choose from, but choose one that's gonna work for you to make it easy that everybody uh, buys into. Uh, the ALFAM organization that I mentioned to you earlier, we use a, a table system. So we kind of fill in the chunks of information. Our One of our goals, overall goals, is um, ALFAM delivers unique content and resources unlike what other museum associations provide for members and those involved with living history and historic agriculture. So that's the big broad goal. Now under that goal, we have to come up with a series of objectives. So I've just put one objective here as an example. Ensure resources are useful, easy to access and relevant to the needs of our membership. New resources should be intentionally developed and cultivated. So that's one of the objectives. Then we need action steps. So if that's the objective to meet that, that goal up there, what are the action steps to meet that objective? And our action steps for this one, strengthen organizational awareness of the STP initiative, which probably doesn't mean much to you if you're not LFM members, but it's our skills training preservation initiative. Enhance the STP and ask platforms, which is just how our members access and search through the database of information and continue to bolster web presence using multiple platforms with a goal of driving traffic to Alfam's website. Another uh, action step is to investigate funding to create accessible resources such as closed captioning for virtual meetings or sessions. So those are action steps to meet that objective that you see in the first column. Now, particularly as an all volunteer organization, it's very important that we assign timeframes to this. So as I say, we don't end up at the end of our three year plan and look back and realize, oh, well, we really haven't done any of those action steps. So then we go back once we figured these out and assign the years. So 2021, those action steps that are listed next to it are what we're tackling this year. Next year, we're gonna look at trying to find funding for closed captioning to make our resources available to a broader range of audience. And then we have to assign who's going to do that. Now, in our case, within that three-year time period, some board members are gonna turn over, some offices are going, uh, officers are going to turn over. So we don't assign it usually to a specific person, it's assigned to a committee. In this case, the first uh, list of action steps up here are assigned to the STP committee, which is our skills training preservation committee and the communications committee. So those two committees have to work together to make those action steps happen. The investigate funding in 2022, well, that's being assigned to the development committee. So the people who serve on those committees have their, their uh, work plan for them to benefit the organization. This isn't the only format to use, certainly. Um, another format is really just kind of creating a, a list. Um, I lifted this from the uh, strategic plan recently completed by the Cherokee Strip Regional Heritage Center. They'd come to the end of their plan and were working and worked to develop a new one, which they just completed last month. So one of their goals is to increase outreach. In order to fulfill our role as a regional heritage center, our reach must expand to all of Northwest Oklahoma. A variety of methods will be enacted to fulfill this goal. Well, those methods then are their objectives. 
One of the objectives under that is to increase attendance at the center. Now, what do you need to know to benchmark that? You need to know what your attendance is now in order to know that you've increased it. And then they have their action steps, for how they're going to go about increasing that attendance. It's a great thing to say, oh, we're going to increase our attendance. Well, that's all well and good. How are you going to do that? And they plan to do it by extending hours of operations to include Sundays, establish city, local, and regional museum tours originating at the center, and creating, creating a digital marketing plan with a strong social media component. So those are some of the action steps to reach that first objective under that first goal. Now, as far as time frame, they added the time frame at the back of their plan where they just broke down those action steps by year and put them in the year they're going to happen. Whatever works for you, there isn't one right way to do it all. Now, in their plan, they did not assign specific responsibilities for accomplishing these. And that can work if you have staff. They have a full-time uh, staff there that includes several people. So as one of the Oklahoma Historical Society properties, I'm looking to that director being responsible for accomplishing these. The director then assigns those tasks to individual employees and their annual work plan so that everybody does have something assigned to them, but it's not right there in the plan. I do think it's, as I said before, vitally important if you're an all volunteer organization, especially that you do make specific assignments to the committee, the officer or a specific person. So as you're looking at developing your goals, you need to make sure that they are smart goals. Once again, one of those terms that gets thrown around. And that just means they need to be very specific, like increase attendance. OK, that's a very specific goal. We need to know that it is measurable. As long as you know where you're starting, you know where you want to go, you're going to know if you achieved an increase in attendance. Is it achievable? Now, if you started out with uh, 12,000 a year attendance and you say that you're going to increase attendance to 100,000 100, individuals within that three year time period, that's probably not going to be uh, realistically achievable. You need to make sure that they are relevant and that just means that they relate to your mission, that they're helping you get to your vision. If they don't relate to your mission, they're not relevant to your community or organization, it should not be one of your goals. And they need to be time based, as I've mentioned repeatedly, so that you know when it's going to happen. It's not just one of those things that someday it's going to happen. We have a, an actual time when it's supposed to be completed. So let's take a look at what some goals might look like for your organization. And once again, do not just cut and paste these. I'm just throwing out examples. And they may or may not be in any way relevant to you, particularly within your three year time frame that you're looking at. But let's say one of your first goals that you come up with is improve the care and accessibility of the collections. Well, that's a great goal to have. Maybe number two is increase financial stability. Well, okay, that's another great goal to have. So now you've got two goals. So what's your next step now? Well, we've got our goals. Next thing is going to be coming up with those objectives. So what does it mean to reach that goal? Okay, maybe improving care accessibility of collections. A good goal is going to be completing an inventory. You can't improve the care and certainly can't improve the accessibility if you have no idea what you have. Uh, maybe another one is to reorganize collection storage. That's another good goal. And then you've got objectives. Now you need some action steps. Well, what action steps am I going to take to complete an inventory? Mm, how about research and purchase a collection inventory software? If you don't have one, that's going to be a very important first step. Uh, maybe you need to purchase new computers that are capable of handling the collections inventory software. And then maybe you need to organize and train volunteers to assist with the inventory. 
because one person's not going to get it all done. Uh, reorganize collection storage. What might be some action steps for that? Well, maybe you need to complete shop drawings of the storage area and build a furnishings plan so that you know what your dimensions are, you know what shelving is going to fit in there, you know what cabinets are going to fit in there, so you don't end up buying something that won't fit and you can make the best use out of your storage space. Uh, maybe then you need to purchase and install some warehouse shelving. Uh, then maybe you need to rehouse the collection items. And maybe your next step then is to remove all the non-collection items from the storage area so that it is only your artifacts and, and archival materials that are in your collection storage. Now, when are these things going to happen? Remember, they need to be assigned to date. So one of your first things in improving the care and accessibility of the collection is that inventory. So we are going to start with the research and purchase of a collections inventory software. Now, you could just have 2022 for that whole objective, complete an inventory, depending on, on your work plan. Or you could have dates for individual steps. Um, who's going to do it? The IT committee, the curator, executive committee, maybe it's just Joe, but whoever is going to do that, you need to record it to make sure that, that somebody's accountable. Purchase a new computer, well, that probably also needs to happen in 2022. Then maybe you're putting off until 2023, training and organizing your volunteers to help you complete that inventory. So, okay, maybe then we're not getting to the shop drawing, uh, of the storage building in, until 2024. Maybe you're doing that before you train your volunteers. It's up to you to organize these steps and what makes most sense to you. Um, then maybe you are purchasing and installing your warehouse shelving in 2024. Then you're going to rehouse your collections. I see a problem here. I'm rehousing the collections before we completed the drawing of the storage or purchase the warehouse shelving. So that needs to be adjusted as you're finalizing your plan. So it's a, it's a process. You'll end up moving your steps around a lot, which is one thing that computers are really great so that you don't have to retype things over and over again. So you'll adjust as you go through and look at it and think, well, that doesn't make sense since uh, moving, rehousing the collections before I have furnished the storage area. Then don't forget the very important step of having your board of directors officially approve and date your strategic plan. You need to make sure that it is the only plan in your organization and that the board has signed off on it. So if you have a board member maybe who's coming to a staff and trying to pull them off in another direction on their pet project, that staff member can say, well, you know, that's a great idea, but here's the, the uh, strategic plan that we're working under right now that the board approves. So this is what I need to focus on. So it's a, it's a good way of keeping everybody moved in the same direction, despite whatever tug of war might be going on with any one person having a pet project. So I hope then that once you've had your strategic plan, you see the big picture, you have that vision, it's a little bit easier to put your jigsaw puzzle together and that you are a little happier and not tempted to pull your hair out because you're facing a long list of things we need to do in our museums. And maybe it can help you tame your squirrels a little bit so that you're not being pulled off in search of squirrels or shiny things um, as often anyway as you were in the past. I'm happy to answer any questions at any time if you want to give me a call or shoot me an email. And I very definitely hope that we're able to meet again in person next year. Uh, a virtual meeting is better than no meeting, but I so very much uh, miss the interaction of, of talking to each of you face to face. So until next year, uh, good luck with your strategic plan. Thank you, Kathy. That was absolutely wonderful. Um, we've got some time for questions. So we've got a Q&A um, section and we also have chat. So uh, by all means, please um, send some questions Kathy's way if you have 
some, um, you know, just some nitty gritty questions about strategic plan development. Um, you've got a, a an expert on your hands here. So let <laughs> Kathy's like, <laughs> That's um, I did get a few questions by email since I posted my email right at the beginning while the presentation oh. was going on. <laughs> and I did want to um, let everybody know that um, Oklahoma Museums Association is having a three part strategic planning workshop um, starting in May. And I think there are still some spots available in that. So that's the Oklahoma Museums Association. And you can check that out on their website. Wonderful. They've done one before, and it's always a very good um, session that they do. Um, it looks like uh, Caitlin has asked, how many people should be involved in a strategic plan? Is there a maximum? Uh, it really kind of depends on the size of your organization. Um, uh, assuming you're a small organization, um, your board of directors, and, and uh, really, I would say all the staff members should be involved so that everybody buys into the plan. It's an inclusive and not an exclusive process, or it should be. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? If not, I will start. Oh, can Kathy share her slides? Um, I bet she can. Do you have the file handy? And if not, um, give it to me later and we can get it on the um, grants website. Yeah, I can share it with you. Okay, perfect. So we'll put it, yeah, I'll send it to you so you can put it up on the grants website. Perfect, okay. Um, and in our Q&A section here, someone's asked that you mentioned facilitators. Are they needed to provide guidelines to develop a plan or simply for retreat planning meetings? Uh, the facilitator really is there to, they help make sure that everybody is engaged in the process. They can direct the conversation if it starts going off the rails. And um, they make sure that one person or one or two people aren't dominating the conversation. So it kind of depends on where you are in your organization, whether you really need a facilitator or not. If you've never done a strategic plan before, it can be very helpful to have a facilitator. And it, it's really inexpensive. And in fact, you can apply for a grant through our, our Heritage Grant Program to help cover the cost of strategic planning. Thanks for that plug, Kathy. Um, yes, as some of you on the um, presentation or on this webinar may know, um, we do have a uh, Oklahoma Heritage Preservation Grant Program at the Oklahoma Historical Society. And one of the requirements for that program for eligibility is that you have to have a strategic plan um, or you have to be applying for the development of a strategic plan. And when we first started it and I looked at those, the rules that, that were in our statutes, I kind of thought, oh, what a hurdle. We don't want to, to to come up with a strategic plan, golly. But the more I really started thinking about it, the more I learned about how important strategic plans are, I just thought, you know, yeah, you, you do need to go through that first step of really understanding what your organization needs, what your goals are for this year or the next three years. Um, otherwise, how are you going to know what project you need to be focusing on? So, um, and it's not just our grant program that requires strategic plans. A lot of grant programs do require it. So it's a really good step uh, in getting yourselves to a place where you can start asking for money from multiple organizations. And it's not a big intimidating document. I think that's the big hurdle for everybody to get over. It should be short. A good plan is short. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I think that was when I watched your session, that was one of the things that I was um, happy to see was that it does seem really intimidating, you know, you, regardless of your organization size, um, there's always something that you're trying to tackle and to, you know, kind of sit down and try to think about that in a, in a fashion that comes across in a small document can seem, can seem like a big task. So um, we have another question that was just, is the recording of the session available? Um, and yes, we will um, have these, all of these sessions are being recorded. Um, and they will be available on our website. Um, and well, actually, the way my file is, Nicole, I guess the sharing the for the folder in your grants program. Do you want the recorded one, or do you just want the PowerPoint presentation? Um, we'll just do the PowerPoint presentation, okay. and then this webinar as a whole with the questions and everything will be available. But I will also be utilizing your strategic plan. Um, session on our website. Um, we have a whole resources tab uh, on our uh, grants website um, 
okhistory.org slash grants. I'll put that in the chat just in just one second. Um, and it has on there a page that um, deals with um, strategic plans. And I will be adding this to our list of resources um, for individuals. Um, while I'm putting that into the chat, someone else has asked what Oh, no, this is something that I have to ask. Never mind. Or I have to answer. Um, what kind of organizations can apply for a grant? Uh, nonprofit. So um, for our grant here at the Oklahoma Historical Society, it is um, nonprofit historical organizations. Um, and we do have a definition of what we mean by historical organizations. So that would be, um, you know, uh, museums, historic sites, um, uh, archives, uh, historical organizations, so like a um, you know a county lo a local county historical society, genealogical organizations, uh, and libraries with special collections um, are all eligible to apply. You do have to be a nonprofit and incorporated within the state of Oklahoma, registered with the Secretary of State's office. Uh, which, if you're not for some reason, is really easy to do. You can do it in like an hour on on the website. Um, tribal entities are eligible and um, Oh, City? Yeah. Local government. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> local government's uh, eligible to apply as well. So, um, you know, if you are doing a project, um, you know, like historical um, wayfinding in your town, that sort of thing, uh, those are all eligible um, uh, entities for, for the grants program. Um, let me go ahead and put this in. Okay, history. History. Org. Um, Kathy, anything else about? Uh, I mean, I know you probably covered everything in your presentation, but anything that you can think of that something's triggered that we've been talking about just now? No, not really. It's just don't be intimidated by the process. It's not as complicated as it sounds. Mm -hmm. Oh, I sent that to panelists instead of. But does anybody else have any more questions? I know that, like I said, this was such a thorough presentation by Kathy that you probably um, may not, you may not have any questions because she really did hit on a lot of, um, on the things that, there we go. Okay, I just said that. Um, okay, um, in terms of when will, so we had a question asking, um, when will all of the sessions, uh, no, no longer be available? Oh, Amy, I don't know the answer to that. Um, if Jennifer is on this session, I don't know if she is or not, if you could um, put a little note in the, um, or Jennifer or Angela, if you guys are on here and you could maybe tell us how long we're gonna keep those on-demand um, sessions up. I would assume we'll have them up for a while. Um, I don't think it's gonna be something that we're pulling um, super quick. Oh yeah, yes. Uh, Yes, they will. So I think they'll be up for quite some time. So no, no need to, to worry about them disappearing on us super quick. And um, for anyone that's on here that was uh, having issues getting into our um, previous um, collections uh, Zoom, that was a Zoom meeting and not a webinar. So we um, we had a limit of a hundred. It will be up on the um, on demand later. So don't worry that you don't get to see it. Um, we just. We were trying to make it more interactive and uh, it had a limit and who would have thought that we would have been so popular. So let me see if there's any other questions that I don't, um, that I haven't been addressed yet. Okay, I think that we have uh, gone through everything and we are just about at our time. So I think that we will go ahead and conclude our, our meeting. Kathy, thank you so much for taking time out of your your schedule and, and sharing your expertise on strategic plans with everybody. You're welcome. Good luck, everybody. Bye. Bye.